Allegiance, and we can recite the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic. Nobody's helping me. One nation under God, indivisible. <laughs> indivisible with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you. Um, Secretary, will you please note that all commissioners, I just saw Isabella, I think. Yep, there she is. All commissioners are in attendance except for Dina Goldberg. Um, the approval of the agenda. I do need to add in the consent agenda, um, which will later on um, another um, personnel memorandum. So do I hear approval of the agenda? I have a change. Who's that? It's Ann. Um, okay. Should we, Harley, should we just put on the agenda? I don't, since we don't know when Dean is gonna show up, can we leave it open so she can do the report out at when she gets here? If she oh, gets yeah. here after 6B? Yeah, oh yeah, that's fine. Yeah, we'll be flexible with her, um, with her timing. Thank you, Ann. All right, yes, Kevin. Earlier, I, I noticed that the uh, discussion about um, the equity training and c working together with uh, CEDAR is not on the agenda this time. And I would, I brought it up last time and it was supposed to make it and it hasn't. Uh, you're right, Kevin, I apologize for that. I just assumed it was in the district equity committee update, uh, but I will make sure it is on there for our next regular meeting. Okay, thank you. Yeah, and I apologize. Anybody else? Erin? Um, I just had a question about the bid awards. So I see the custodial, the laptop, but I'm not seeing the um, Stafford what? Tech and the Perkins. Right now, right now we're just approving the regular agenda, then we'll go ahead and approve the consent agenda. Oh, okay. Yeah. Anything else for the regular agenda? Okay, hearing none. Um, the agenda then will be approved. Let's talk about the consent agenda. Uh, that consent agenda includes minutes of the previous meeting, personnel memorandum 622, and there was an addition of 622A that came via email today. Acceptance of IDEAB, IDEA pre-K grants, and the bid awards for custodial supplies, laptops, and staff. Anybody like to make agenda? And make a motion to accept the consent agenda or have changes thereof. I'll make Anne? a motion to accept. It's Ann. Um, can okay, I just Anne, pull out? Yeah. Uh, I have a, a question and um, a request. Question is minutes of previous meetings. Does that, yeah. it says meeting, um, does that include all the other minutes? Because if not, we need to approve a whole bunch of other minutes. Uh, maybe it was just a typo and it should be plural. That it is um, um, meeting minutes because there are also the committee meetings will also go out too with the agenda. And so that's included in that. Yeah. Um, I'd like to pull out the meeting regular meeting minutes for a correction, please. Okay. Anybody else have this anything to pull out? Charlie, uh, no. Anybody else have anything to pull out? Okay. So we have pulled out the minutes of the previous meeting. The consent agenda includes personnel memorandum 622 and 622A, the two bids, the two grants, and the three bids. All in favor of accepting the, the consent agenda, signify by saying aye. Aye. Okay, any opposed? Okay, so carry. Okay, Ann, thank you. Uh, you wanna make a motion with the corrections in that meeting? In a minute? Uh, just a simple correction on the second page of the minutes. Uh, one of the speakers name, Amelia, should be spelled E-M-E-L-I-A, please. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have any changes in the minutes? Do I hear a motion to accept the minutes? Brittany, I do to, I hear I, see a second? Second. Okay, Charlene. 
All those in favor of accepting the minutes with the uh, stated changes signify by, by saying aye or raise your hand. All aye. those opposed? Motion carries. Okay, we're at the point where we do our public input. I again will ask Mr. Uh, Bliss to do our two minutes limitation and let them in one by one. I believe there's three of them. And I will ask them to state their name and where they're from because I apologize that on the last one. All right, so the first one on my roster is Haley Russo. Let me see if I can allow her to talk. Haley, can you hear me? I can hear you. All right, okay. Haley, you have two minutes. Okay. And Haley, yeah. where are you from? I'm from Rutland, Vermont, and I currently live in Clayton, North Carolina. Okay, thank you. I want, you I'd like you to- two minutes. Like, okay, I'd like to thank the Rutland City School Board members for allowing me the opportunity to be heard tonight. Um, I, I wanna make a few points. First being that the only job of the school board I realize is not to make a change or reinstate a name and logo at RHS. I realize that some of the campaigns during the March elections and before that made a point to say that returning the Raider was an objective during their time on the board. And as a reminder, the time, their time on the board is three years. Um, I, I'm saying this because I know there's a lot of people that are very upset that it didn't get done 10 days ago, two weeks ago, a month ago, what have you, you know, um, it's going to take time. I understand that. And I know there's much more important things that you guys are working on all the time, you know, secondly, I'd like to ask for everybody there to have some grace. I realize that all of you are volunteering your time away from your families to try and make the Rutland County public school system a great one. Honestly, I think instead of people cutting everybody down, maybe they should try their hand at running for a position on the board and doing a better job. You know, nobody has received excessive training for any of this, and I commend all of you for being there. Um, the majority of the city voters decided they wanted to have those of you that are on the board there. So, you know, let's give you guys the chance to do what you're going to do and understand, like I said before, that nothing happens overnight. The last point I'd like to make is that the story of the Native Americans Ten is seconds. one that needs to be told by not needs to be told and by removing names and symbols, it's a step in erasing natives from society. There are plenty of people passionate about the radar being reinstated. The passion also should be for bringing native um, education Stephanie, to the schools. Up. I mean, Haley. Yes, sir. Stephanie is in my right. Haley, I'm sorry. Your two minutes are up, but I appreciate you uh, speaking to the board tonight. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. Mr. Bliss. Next, I have Greg Fair. Let me see if he's in the queue here. I don't see Greg's name at the moment. Hang on one okay. sec, one more look. My next person, there's one other person on it. Oh, no, I do have Greg, thank you. All right. Okay. Hi, Greg, sorry to uh, keep you waiting. You have two minutes. Hi, y'all, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, yes Greg, we can hear you. Thank you, thank you. Hello, commissioners. Thank you for the opportunity to let me make some comments this evening regarding this issue. I support restoring the Raider name to Rutland High School as a graduate of MSJ when we were not competing on the athletic fields or the courts or in a cheer competition, a spelling bee or on a theater stage. I was a proud Raider supporter. I believe that the Raider is more than just a name or a mascot. It's tradition an identity. It's who people become because of their love and respect for their school the same way the Native Americans feel about their culture and heritage. Using the Raider name is an honor. It shows respect and commitment to never, never, never letting their story fade away. Now it's time to call the question, <clears throat> excuse me. Mr. President, I call on you to call the question. The respect for this process has been largely upheld. The board's policies and Robert's rules are being followed. It's time to call the question. Thank you. Enjoy your evening. Thank you, Mr. Thank President. You. Thank you, Mr. Bliss. 
Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thayer. Okay, um, who is um, next? Next, we have Tammy Lancor. Let me see if I have her in the queue. QRST, here she is, stand by. Tammy, can you hear us? Unmute yourself. She's on, but she's muted. Um, Tammy, if you can hear us, you need to unmute yourself. Okay. Seems like we're having a technical problem. Uh, okay. If we can fix it, I'll let you know. Okay, thank you, Mr. Bliss. All right, next is the student representative report. My understanding is we have to say goodbye to somebody tonight. And we were gonna say hello to somebody, but I hear she's in a game right now. So who wants to start? I can start. Okay. So you, at Mary. RAS, field day was on Monday. I would like to give a special thanks to the Rutland City Fire Department for coming to help cool down the students. They made the day extra special. We are asking all of our school issued Chromebooks and chargers to be returned to school by June 14th, with the exception of our remote learners who can return their Chromebooks and chargers anytime on June 16th, 17th, and 18th. Our year end progress reports will be sent home with students on June 16th and mailed to our remote students. Class placements will go home on June 11th, and we will hold step up with your next year's class on June 15th. Lastly, the final parent survey, survey of the year has been sent to our families. We ask that families complete this survey to help strengthen our relationships. RIS wishes everyone a safe and healthy summer break. Northwest and Northeast students also culminate their year of PBIS with a school-wide celebration, Field Day. At Northwest, Field Day was held today at Meadow Street Park with a very necessary cooling down for all thanks to the Rutland City Fire Department. Thanks also to the Rutland City Police Department for ensuring that Northwest students had a safe journey to and from Meadow Street and for providing cold water and ice pops. Northeast Field Day will be this Thursday. As a reminder to all families of incoming kindergartners, now is the time to register your child. At both Northwest and Northeast, we have some fun kinder camp, hour long get to know you sessions before the next school year begins. We want all of our incoming students and families to be able to join us. Please call our schools to get the registration information. With the global pandemic concerns all year long, we wish to thank our students and families for their vigilance in maintaining safety procedures, as well as their understanding, patience, and support during necessary quarantines and subsequent remote learning sessions. And we extend a huge thank you to all of our dedicated staff and faculty for going far above and beyond on behalf of our students throughout this school year. That's all for me. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Isabella. Hi, uh, the last few weeks of school are always crazy busy in all schools and RMS is no exception. On May 28th, we welcomed the Traveling Artist Residency Program dripped on the road to our school. These three graphic artists are dedicated to fostering a unique creative environment for resident artists while enhancing the visual atmosphere of communities through public art. The mural designed by the artist and some students, um, I'm sorry, uh, uh, was created through, with environmentally friendly paints. The mural is currently located in the gym lobby for everyone to see. This past Friday, our students presented their final projects for the Art for Action Interdisciplinary Unit in the gym. Projects focus on how students are and plan to be addressing a few of the sustainable development goals adapted by the United Nations member states in 2015. As one of our step up day experiences, the sixth graders were invited to the fair to see some examples of middle school projects and give feedback. We are super excited to hold class days this year. Each house will be having a fun day at a different park this week. Birch is going to Lake Dunmore. Bridges goes to White's Pool and Park. Hickory to Bomazine State Park. 
and Maple to Echo Lake. We will also have five days of our extended extended school program ESP before our last day, June 16th. Thanks to everyone for making this most unusual year positive and productive for the students. For the high school, as I mentioned last meeting, a graduation will be hosted on the alumni football field on Thursday, June 17th, and students will be offered five tickets for family and friends. Uh, senior day will be June 15th at Killington Adventure Park Snowshoe Lodge to celebrate the closing year. A senior dance will be held that evening for our HS graduates. You froze up. Isabella. Be sure to check your emails for the complete schedule. <clears throat> Both the women's lacrosse team and tennis teams are still on the hunt for their state championships. Women's lacrosse is playing tonight as we speak. And I just wanted to say before, um, Isabella, you froze up. Isabella, I think you're back again. Did you want to say? Oh, sorry. I was just going to say thank you to Hannah for the work that she's done this year. I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Schillinger for a minute. And um... Well, thank you. Uh... Uh, Commissioner Kavakis, I just want to thank Hannah for her years of service on the on the, the school board. Uh, as many of you know, uh, as you know, you've gotten to know her as a, a student representative. What you may not know is that in her free time outside of uh, uh, this job, she's also a global studies and STEM concentration scholar. Uh, she is both a field hockey and a track athlete. She's a member of too many clubs for me to list here this evening. Um, and uh, it is, uh, I'm really encouraged and, and gratified to tell you that she will be attending the University of Vermont next year in as a member of the nursing program. Um, and that is really great to hear. So Hannah, thank you so much for your service and all that you've contributed. Thank you. And Mr. Schillinger, do you want to tell us who will be joining us? I, I would, I'd be happy to. Unfortunately, uh, she's not able to join us right now. Uh, Lauren, uh, familiar name, Lauren Salamano, um, who, who may, may know Hannah, um, uh, will be joining us at our next meeting. The semifinal lacrosse game uh, is scheduled, was scheduled for this evening. So she is in South Burlington currently. Um, but she will be joining us at our next at our next meeting. Uh, Isabella will be um, uh, promoted to the senior student member, uh, and Lauren Salamano will be joining us at our next meeting. Thank you. Any questions of our two student reps, um, Brittany? I just wanted to add uh, congratulations. Thank you both for everything you've done. Um, but I also want to congratulate the staff of Northwest. I spent the day with them today, um, hanging out and playing in the fields at Meadow Street. The, the teachers and the staff did an incredible job. Um, all of the teachers, it was it was great. They all got gills for them. You know, they had all put in, and so they all got gills. The fire department came down. Uh, the police department was. Um, they were in the potato sack racing and the kids asked them to do a bunch of stuff. So it was really awesome to see all the kids participate and they were all, you know, being really good about not kind of, you know, coming together, still kind of following those codes of, of COVID. Um, so it was a great, it was a wonderful, successful day for them, even though it was like a hundred degrees and all those classes decided to not take the buses back. They opted to walk back. Um, and that was their choice that they they wanted to do that, so they were helpful. So, shout out to to Northwest and to thank all of them for doing that, Lindsay and Lauren. 
All right, thank you. Um, Brittany, anybody have comments? Stephanie? I want to, uh, again, take time to uh, thank Hannah for her time on the board as student rep and also to Isabel as well. Um, and just a girls across update, they act, I just got a text, they did lose 12-10. Uh, uh, they were winning up to the half, so they definitely put in a hard fought game against South Burlington. Okay, thank you. Uh, Anne, do you have your hand up? Okay. All right, so I'm going to turn it over now to Pam for the District Equity Committee update. And Pam, will you remember Cedar? Hey there, everybody. Um, say that again. We remember the report we need from Mr. Key Faber. Okay. Okay. Sure. I'm not. Um, Kevin, could you tell me what it is that you're looking for? What I was looking for was a discussion about um, the training that uh, the Cedar Group had and their recommendation that we get the same training. All right, I'll go through and talk about the um, work of the district equity, equity work group. And then um, maybe Rob can have some insight on that on the Cedar Meadow. So I'm joined by uh, Gio Felco and Gio has been the student who has participated the most in our monthly meetings. Um, so good evening and thank you for giving us the opportunity to share with you some of the activities of the work group. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen, hopefully. Hey, Rob. I'm okay. here. My, um, it's not coming up as an option. It's saying I can screen, but my slideshow isn't coming up as an op option. Can you share yours? Sure can. Thank you. There it is. Um, so I just wanted to give kind of a brief walk down memory lane. Uh, you might remember that the idea of and the direction for a district-wide committee to focus on equity came early in the winter of 2020 before the pandemic from the school board. After um, our time apart last year, Rob and I were anxious to pick up the charge that was given to us um, by the school board. In the fall of this year, we asked faculty, staff, administrators, students, and school board members to volunteer their time to gather monthly to focus on the topic of equity. In October, nearly 40 of us gathered via Zoom after some initial group work to set the stage for our time together, such as establishing group norms and sharing why we were interested in talking about equity. We started thinking and talking about how equity connects to the Rutland City Public Schools vision statement. As you might expect, it became apparent that the word equity evokes different thoughts and feelings, as well as meanings. Therefore, we worked for a good chunk of time uh, to come to an agreement on a definition of equity that provides us with a shared platform from which to start our work. And if you could go to the next slide, Rob. Thanks. Gio? So one of the biggest tasks that the, that the equity committee had from the beginning was developing definitions that students and teachers um, could use and see on a daily basis and to show them you know, what the Rutland City Public Schools means when we're talking about equity. So we came up with two definitions, one for adults in our buildings and one for students. So the adult definition was increasing the possibility of success for all, interrupting systemic practices that neg neg negatively impact students based on who they are and providing equal access for all and cultivating every student. For students, the definition is everyone gets what they need to become who they are self-determined to be, making sure that nothing is in the way of any student growing to become the talented and wonderful humans they are. To, to um, spread the message that we're trying to share in these definitions, um, the our committee, uh, particularly the subcommittee of communication, came up with these posters that are posted around Rowland High School and Rowland Middle School and will eventually be posted um, throughout the buildings um, in our district. And if Mr. Bliss can go to the next slide, they're shown there. Um, so those are the posters that we have created. Um, and it includes some images that I first saw at our gym conference um, a couple years ago um, with the theme inclusivity um, and our 
keynote speaker shared these with us. Um, so we thought this would be a good way to um, talk about equity in our buildings. And so students can see those definitions every day. Um, and coming up with these definitions, you know, it kind of hit home what we mean when we talk about equity in our, in our buildings. And it talks about what aspects of equity we wanna look at um, throughout our, the district. Thanks, Gio. Can you go ahead to the next slide, Rob? So after we were satisfied with our common understanding and the definition of, of equity, we spent some time thinking and brainstorming about what our schools would look like after we had engaged in equity work after a few years. And we asked the question, you know, thinking about our work over five years, what is the equitable experience that students and their families ha would have as they walked in the doors and took part in their educational process? We, became, we came up with some pretty innovative ideas about how to help all students, but one of the looming questions became, how do we even get started? It was agreed that we needed to investigate resources that would be available to us, both within our community and beyond. Initially, the group looked at nine different national organizations that offered a variety of supports to schools and organizations that were looking to engage in equity work. It was during this review of resources that we discovered and agreed that an equity audit would be appropriate, would be an appropriate next step. So you might be saying, what's an equity audit? Um, an equity audit is a study of the fairness of institutional practices, programs, and policies. Such audits re represent a significant investment in resources, which are both human and material. So the work group narrowed the nine organizations down to three and volunteers formed a subgroup to further explore viable resources and to make a recommendation to the whole group. After further investigation, the recommendation was to use the resources and the support from the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium. Additionally, a subgroup formed to focus on communication, helping to identify resources within our community and stakeholders that we need to engage with. From that subcommittee work that um, I both I just mentioned and that Geo mentioned, um, the work between the Rutland Middle School and Rutland High School student councils were formed, and you'll hear a little bit more about that. Um, one of the benefits of the equity work group is that it includes representation from all different buildings. Therefore, we're just by getting together and talking about equity, we're able to learn and grow just by listening and learning about various practices that are happening throughout the district. I put in right on the slideshow a couple of examples, you know, just learning and, and knowing um, so that people from the high school can know about a food bank that was started at RIS, the professional development that was being offered throughout the district, grant funds to purchase children's books that culture um, that help to cultivate diversity are just some of the, of the things that we talked about. You can go to the next slide. Gio is going to talk um, for a minute or two about the um, work that the student councils have done um, in helping to engage students. So one of the tasks um, that was identified by the communication subcommittee was how are we going to reach students with these definitions and, and how are we going to talk about equity in the classrooms. Um, so to guide this mission, the RMS and RHS student councils work together to plan how to spread these messages to our students and even the faculty. Um, part of that work included making those posters as we talked about before and developing surveys and talking points for teachers that they could address in class. Um, as we refine those throughout the end of this year and into the summer, um, we're looking at possibly implementing those into the next year. Um, in addition, just today actually, we finally got down to the middle school, um, some RHS representatives to talk about student government participation at, at RMS. Um, so you might ask like, how is that connected to equity? Um, and, I, and I think that equity is in different aspects of everything we do at Rutland High School, um, and including getting people ready you know, to participate in activities and events at RHS. Um, we don't want students to feel unprepared. We wanna make sure everyone has specialized supports um, when they get to the, the high school building. Um, so we gave them, you know, all the necessary information they needed, all the paperwork today, so that they can make a difference when they got to RHS. Um, and then also some of the work we did was, you know, communicating with students. Um, and then I was bringing back some 
ideas that students had um, to the larger equity committee. Um, some lots of students had input on what they would like to see moving forward. So we were really getting students involved throughout this entire process, which I think is important when talking about topics like equity, because student voice is very important um, to make sure the buildings are are how they would like to how they like it to be. Thanks, Gio. So our last activity of the school year is a survey for faculty and staff and students uh, in grades seven through 12 and our community, which of course includes parents and guardians. As a part of the committee's work, we need a better understanding of the experiences, thoughts, and perceptions of our stakeholders. It's imperative that we have concrete data from the groups that I mentioned so that our direction can be well-informed and targeted. We want to avoid assumptions and eliminate any implicit bias that we as a work group may have. And obtaining con concrete data through a survey from everyone is how we can best do that. So that brings us to our next steps. Over the summer months, uh, our work group members will have the opportunity to review and analyze the data that was collected from the completed surveys. Additionally, we will plan the rollout of the equity audit, which will be done using the materials and the support from the Mid-Atlantic Equity Consortium, sorry. And finally, for those who are able, we'll engage in a shared learning experience. We will read the book, Belonging Through a Culture of D Dignity by Floyd Cobb and John Cronapple. I keep having to look at his name because it doesn't flow naturally to me. I imagine you have questions or concerns at this point or comments. So we're happy to answer any questions that you have regarding the work of the Equity Committee. Questions? Okay, Kevin. How were, how were members of the committee chosen? It was anyone that was interested in volunteering. So um, a message went out to um, all staff and administration, faculty, and um, principals sent out messages for students um, so that we could get, and anyone that wanted to join could. Um, we started with 40 members. I would say that we had consistent presentation, um, representation from about 20 to 25. Depending on the meeting time and date, um, it has ebbed and flowed. Um, I would say the last meeting was the least attended, which is to be expected this time of year. Um, but th that's that's how it was chosen. Okay. Brittany? Uh, other questions, Brittany? Um, yeah, Pam, did you have um, you you said all schools, so that includes the like Allen Street campus and and those guys as well? Yes, yep, okay. all programs, all schools were invited to attend. Yep. Perfect, and then the only other thing with the equity, are we looking at, when we look at equity, are we looking at also economically where we stand as a, as a region, as we kind of, as we're going into the summer, I'm a little bit concerned obviously with, with the economic status um, where we stand. So I just wanna make sure that we've included some of those guys as well. Thank you for that question, because that is a, a great segue for me to just make sure I put the plug in that when we talk about equity, we're talking about all areas of equity, not just, you know, race or gender or disability or ability or um, it, we're talking all poverty, socioeconomic, we're talking everything that has to do with creating an equitable playing field for all of our students. Perfect. Thank you. You're welcome. I see Aaron's out here and the hand up. And Hurley's on mute, but talking. <laughs> so sorry. I had to, wow. you, okay, I had sorry. to call you out. So really, I just, I wanted to say, I really congratulate you for the work that's been done and the student engagement. I think there's a lot. I look forward to getting surveys. Mm -hmm. And also the, the five-year projection was really exciting for me because things do take time and there's steps and evolving. So that was great to really be looking forward. Um, and Giovanni, um, you're gonna have to like keep the students rolling to keep them engaged. So you have to keep the message back, okay? Because <laughs> um, I think, you know, the middle school is, is an untapped asset too for, for student voice. Um, 
Yeah, I think that was kind of it. And, you know, to Brittany's point, I know you said food bank, so there is community engagement and, um, of course, keep using the other community resources we have and, um, you know, keep the communication open, I guess I'm saying. <laughs> thank so you. thank you for all your work. Thank you. Uh, anybody else have a question? I just wanted to circle back around there. Kevin had a question about the um, Cedar Group. And I don't have that information. I'm not sure because that wasn't something that the equity work group had taken on. Bill or Rob, do you have information about that? Yes. Yeah, so um, even prior to the last board meeting, I know that, that Bill had reached out to Lyle Jepson to have a conversation about the level and type of training they had. And so uh, we do understand the, the kind of excellent work they did. But to this point, we haven't made a connection to uh, engage any specific training yet. Okay, uh, Mr. Olson. Kevin, your your request was that, that the board gets the same training as as the chamber board. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I did talk to Lyle about that, um, but as far as talking about it this meeting, that that was off my radar. Radar, and I apologize. It, it should have been. I, I know you had requested it. Now that I think about it. Yeah, I, I it not being on the agenda. I mean, I think it's it's really not something the equity committee heads done. Right. It's some probably a discussion we need to have and, and approve of of that kind of, of training. Um, I know his group recommended that we get the same training so that we're all speaking the same language so that we can work together. Um, so yeah, yeah, I had I mean, the this same is an words. equity issue, but I don't think the equity committee was was charged with addressing it. And, and Kevin, I take uh, some of that responsibility because we did discuss doing something during the retreat. Uh, coming up in August uh, and with part of that training. And I knew when I met with Lyle about it, I know there are different components of the training that you buy uh, or you purchase. So that's something that we were talking about too, but I apologize about for earlier. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much for allowing us Thank the opportunity you. to share. Thank you. All right. Um, so next on the agenda is our superintendent's report. Thank you, Ray. Um, I just want to update the board, maybe for the last time, I hope, about the, uh, in the community, about the state of the pandemic and our response. I guess I'd like to start by thanking the board, especially in the, the community, our friends, our parents, and really the staff and the students for what was, in my opinion, an absolutely incredible commitment that everyone made in helping us make it through this challenging year successfully. We had a very, very good year. I think in hindsight, it might be easy to take for granted that we were in person the whole year and we were able to complete the year so well. But I always remember kind of put my, my mind back to August when we were going into the school year, not knowing what was going to happen. And there really were no guarantees of how this was going to proceed. And uh, we, we made it through very well. So I'm incredibly grateful to the whole community, every member for pulling together to make certain that our students were able to safely attend in person or remotely if that's what their, their needs were. I think we, we were able to pull that off because everybody was, was committed. And I also wanna thank, I know sometimes they, get, they don't get all the, the credit that they deserve, um, our friends at the Agency of Education in the Department of Health who worked with us throughout the year. Um, we met with them, those folks constantly to help us navigate through the, the pandemic. So thank you to both the AOE and Department of Health. And ultimately it comes down to all of us working together as a community to, to make this happen. So thanks, thanks to everyone. So we expect, we hear that the governor will lift the emergency order soon, perhaps before the end of the school year, before the end of next week. So what does that mean? Um, based on the recommendations from the Agency of Education in the Department of Health, what that means for our schools is that we're going to continue with the practices that we established at the beginning of the year, just for the last, really for the end of this week and for next week. Um, so if the order gets lifted, we're just going to continue on the practices that we have in place. So we're maintaining the status quo. The logic of that is the Department of Health is telling us that not all students are, are vaccinated or fully vaccinated anyway. And also the agency of education is saying it's, it's too challenging for schools to change that change their operational procedures at this point with just a few days left. So we're going to basically keep what we have in place um, and 
we'll when we get to next year, though, there'll be a different story. So the emergency order will be lifted. And what will happen, as we've been advised by the Agency of Education, is we'll return back to the practices that we had in place before the pandemic. So specifically, that means we are returning to full in-person learning. There won't be any distancing requirements with students and staff. And I'm going to quote the AOE guidance um, to make sure I'm very specific. The AOE said, if in their latest piece of guidance, they said, if any or some virus mitigation measures are necessary, they likely will be nominal and not specific to schools. So we expect that we should generally be back to the, the way we were before. Um, a topic that's been brought up recently in the media is about snow days. So they, the AOE specifically made clear that uh, if, as we were able to go to remote learning during, during inclement weather this year, that option is not gonna be available next year. So we won't use the remote learning in the event of a snowstorm. Um, so that's that's it for next year. That's that's the guidance that we've had so far. I expect that there might be a bit more coming out over the course of the next few weeks or through the summer. Um, but th that's the, the general guidance that they gave us at the just last week, actually. I'll speak to the vaccination efforts. I, I want to encourage our community to get vaccinated. We still still have a little little bit of, way, of a ways to go. I would like to thank the Department of Health for offering us a location for vaccinations. Uh, that happened over the last few weeks and it completed today at Rutland High School. So we're reminding families that there are vaccinations available for students aged 12 years and up. So we encourage families to take advantage of that. Um, and as I understand it from our weekly communications with the Agency of Education, it's it appears that there will be a vaccine likely available approved by the CDC for students younger than 12 sometime during the summer. So when we hear about that news and we can help communicate that for the benefit of the Department of Health, we will do that. Uh, let's see, we were updated by our student representatives about end of the year activities. And um, so I, I'll, I'll cut this part short, but I will say that last week, Friday, Stafford hosted a big award ceremony under a big tent and they were able to have that ceremony in person. It was really great to watch. Uh, they also streamed it live for parents to watch. It was really nice to see, and I want to congratulate all those Stafford seniors. Um, I, I always come to the end of the year and you forget about how meaningful the end of the year is. It was very meaningful to, to hear the words of the great accomplishments that those kids were able to achieve. And um, especially in Stafford where we're you know, every I think most things are, are very much hands on and they were still able to pull this off and be successful this year. So congratulations to Stafford Tech seniors. We heard about um, Rutland High School's events and I'll just say congratulations to the class of 2021. Though that, that whole school has worked very hard to make sure our seniors got to the finish line and we still have a, a little bit of a ways to go. So we're, we're encouraging kids to finish up but congratulations to the high school team for making um, the whole the year for all four grades and especially for our seniors as normal as possible. And congratulations to those 12th grade seniors. Just to remind everybody that graduation is Thursday the 17th um, at 4, 4 p.m. We set it up. You muted yourself, Bill. I hey, muted myself. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> uh, soon this Zoom stuff will be over. Um, sorry, I don't know where I left off. But anyway, uh, I was talking about graduation on the 17th at 4 o'clock. We said that it will be at 4 o'clock because we need to be able to push graduation back, possibly, if, if, if we have rain during the daytime. So we try to give ourselves some flexibility that, that way. Um, I also want to... Welcome back as our graduation speaker, Mr. Dave Walk, RHS, RHS class of 1971. And congratulations to all those families for making it through a very challenging year. I have one more thing to announce um, and it's it's been in the media already in the Rutland Herald, but I want to congratulate and recognize a member of the class of 2021 for a very, very rare and special recognition RHS 
senior, John Cotter, was named as one of 161 high school seniors across the country as a US presidential scholar, one of only two in Vermont. It's a great achievement. John is one of this, the number of seniors this year across the country is 3.6 million seniors. They're expected to graduate this year and only 6,000 people, seniors qualified as a candidate for these awards. And then he made it out of those 6,000. He was one of one of two from Vermont. And just to tell you a little bit about the, the recognition, the White House Commission on Presidential Scholars selects scholars annually based on their academic success, artistic and technical excellence, essays, school evaluations, transcripts, and evidence of community service leadership and a demonstrated commitment to high ideals. So congratulations to John and his family. That's a truly noteworthy achievement. And we are planning to have John back uh, on campus in 2071 so he can speak to his 50 year class celebration. So we'll see you then, John. Thanks, Earl, that's all I have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Olson. Anybody have questions for Mr. Olson? Anne. Thank you, Bill, for that. That's awesome update. Um, I don't really have a question, but um, the rep from the board to Stafford, what uh, she did already, Bill. Um, a shout out to Ms. Connor. She runs a tight ship um, career in tech ed. Uh, she's got a lot of experience and has done an awesome job this year. Um, they, she and Ms. Delpha um, arranged an uh, National Technical Honor Society induction ceremony, which was an excellent ceremony, um, and also the uh, senior celebration. So I wanted to um, thank also Ms. Silo and Ms. Thies and um, for really honoring our students, uh, seniors, this, this way. Um, and also to wish Ms. Delpha an amazing retirement. Thank you for your work. Hey, thank you, Ann. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay. Uh, next, we're going to be talking about recovery planning, and I believe I turn that over to Mr. Bliss. That's me. Thanks, Mr. Kavakis. And I, I just saw you crack a smile when they were talking about snow days. I really appreciate that. Um, so um, my topic briefly is going to be a, a very large one, but I'll condense it to offer some critical points of information. And that is what the state is calling recovery. And I'm gonna share my screen um, so you can see my little presentation. And I'll walk through this pretty quickly, um, but this is just the district overview tonight. Um, nothing, nothing too in depth, but we wanted to give you and the community a bit of an idea of what we're doing, what we're planning and what kind of work we can see going forward. Um, so the first thing I just wanted to note is during the springtime, we've already been doing what, what anybody else would call recovery work. We started thinking about this back in November, December, realizing uh, some of the challenges that some of our students were facing. And we want you to know that at the intermediate and middle school, we did a, a literacy-based drama engagement program after school for kids. It was a big hit. Keep your eyes open for the video of the play that they just produced last Friday. Uh, it'll be on, of course, we couldn't have live attendees in an indoor venue, but I can't wait to put that up on our webpage and also um, our Facebook. Special thanks to the Recreation Department for partnering with us on that. Um, we already have been doing targeted after tool, school tutoring uh, with transportation and snacks for students that needed some extra help. Uh, April vacation and ESP end of the year program tutoring at Rutland Middle School to help those kids. And at Rutland High School, uh, we have after school tutoring and yes plan to focus on credit recovery for any students that may need that kind of support, especially any seniors who um, may need a little extra help or time to complete some credits that they have to gain graduation. All right. The recovery planning process is one that's outlined by the Agency of Education, and we essentially walk through it. Um, there's a link there in the slides, and I sent these slides to the board today. That link is to uh, a VPR presentation or program that Secretary of Education Dan French was on last Friday. I think he did a fine job of explaining how the state is approaching this topic of recovery. 
All right, for us, we do a needs assessment, we do a recovering plan, and then you do an evaluation and refinement. Plan, do, study, act. Plan, do, study, act. That's the method. So during the needs assessment, among the things that we saw in ours is that our students are lonely, they're sad, too many disconnected, lacking meaningful peer relations with teachers. And we see that as having a correlate, correlative and direct effect, especially on our traumatized students and students who may have come to us from disadvantaged socioeconomic ground, uh, places. And an ever larger percentage of our students are, were basically kind of unavailable for learning. And that has to do with how they're reacting socially, emotionally. We've seen that even for some kids, just visiting the school is, is like doing something brand new again. So we're working on that. Those, one of the things, those are the things that we spotted in our needs assessments that were the key in social emotional learning and mental health and well-being. Uh, during engagement and truancy, um, we were looking, doing a needs assessment there. And it's clear, our students um, highly in need of really engaging instruction and co-curricular activities to keep them engaged in school and ready to keep coming back. Under academic achievement, and by the way, those three topics, social emotional learning, uh, engagement, and academic achievement are the three prongs that the state had us assess in and work with. And so under academic achievement, uh, our assessment yielded that we have, we still need highly engaging instruction, uh, integrated and aligned pre-K through 12 curriculum. That'll be a project over the next three years. Um, additional supplemental instruction, like the after-school tutoring we described, like summer instruction. And so the significant gaps we see can create some equity questions for all kids. I was speaking with um, some leaders in curriculum today, and we were discussing how you organize your school if you have a fifth grader who's gonna be walking into fifth grade in the fall of 2021, the last time they were in school was March of 2020 when they were a third grader. And so if they have not been able to keep pace with the reading and they were completely remote, um, we have some gaps to close up. So we're working on how we address those inequities of student readiness. Um, our students have done surprisingly well, and I would say incredibly well based on the data I've seen from teachers, but we do have some students about whom we're concerned. Um, so phase one uh, in for, the, for the agency of education is you have to create this recovery plan and then implement it. And so for, for us this summer, we're working on summer engagement, outreaching to families, uh, meeting with designated agency, Rutland Mental Health to see how we can connect and serve our families even better and make more of the capacity that they have. Uh, we're out there already advertising for additional counselors and uh, interventionists. Uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. And as students return, the critical importance of creating an inclusive community is at the forefront because we'll have kids that will be coming back to school that they haven't seen in over a year, perhaps. And we're gonna continue to focus on trauma, intelligent and restorative practices. Uh, under truancy and engagement, this summer, we are doing some seriously, seriously intense outreach to families that we haven't seen or heard from in a while. Uh, once again, building engaging instruction and project-based and community-based learning, a lot of which you've heard and seen about at Rutland Middle School and at Allen Street Campus. That's just good learning for anybody. Um, we're creating early warning dashboards for how we can see if we have a student who is more at risk from being an attendance um, concern. And an uh, ever bigger focus on family engagement that goes beyond events. It goes beyond coming to concert. It is about connecting with families, one family at a time, helping them understand and have the tools they might need to help their kids at home and participate with their kids at home in learning. Under academics and achievement, um, we have to increase the intention the, in, the intervention availability, frequency, intensity. With that, as we hire on recovery, uh, recovery support, recovery fund supported interventionists, we're gonna look at flexing their schedules so they can be available at after school times. 
um, so that we can have more and more support for our kids beyond the school day, beyond the year, targeted and specific. Just creating a, a reading group isn't good enough. We, we have to target the skills that the kids have, uh, the skill deficits they have. And we're hearing from our teachers who are doing the tutoring this year that it's making a significant difference. Um, highly engaged first instruction, align our K-12, reorganize MTSS, and we're going to work on a professional development plan. I just have three more slides. I'll go quickly. Um, so after you do your first year, you have to evaluate what you've done. And what the state will ask us is, you know, what are the sustaining practices that have, just, that have achieved the results you wanted? So what did you do that you're going to keep? And then what did you learn about effectiveness? And what aren't you going to keep in your plan? And that'll be at the end of next year. We'll issue that. And then, so one of the things people ask about is this, the, the federal funding that's coming to us, you know, to support this effort. And it is, um, they're coming in, we already heard, you heard about uh, emergency uh, funds for the, for the pandemic. You heard Mr. Plamenez present about those earlier in the year. You heard about ESSER 1, then the, then the government issued ESSER 2 and ESSER 3. The important thing about these, each one of these, what I call funding sources, each one has its own significant list of restrictions and requirements. They are not the same. And so as we go through them, we have to watch carefully what are the federal requirements for those things. And we are working hard to make sure we know what those are. One of the greatest terms we heard recently is the state of Vermont just got from the feds the interim final guidance from the feds. So it's, they think it's final, but not really. And that could change. And so as we work on how we're gonna invest this to sustain our students' learning, we have to pay attention to that. ESSER 2 lasts through September 30th, 2023. And uh, ESSER 4 through 2024. And those were our uh, windows of application of those funds. And I just tell you that because what we've learned is kind of our, our methodical pace to planning for this is going to pay off. There are many districts in the state of Vermont who hustled out and signed contracts to spend the money, who spent the money, um, and who already have gone way down the road in terms of, of laying out funds that, that they were going to receive. And what they're learning now is they didn't do it correctly. And so the state is working to hustle and support them because the state wants to help everybody. But by us being careful and learning exactly how we do this correctly, it's a big help. That's a lot of information on a gigantic topic. I just wanted to share that overview with you. And if you had any quick questions, I'd be happy to take them. Okay. Ooh, okay. Tricia, I saw your hand first, then Brittany and Charlie. All right. Bear with me. All right. Yeah. Um, so I'm just curious um, how you feel the children are currently performing if you had to um, look back uh, through a looking glass of prior years. Um, for as far as milestone expectations, do you feel like they are significantly behind or at present the children that have been going to school are at the expected outcome that we would expect them to be, whether or not there had been a pandemic? Mr. Bliss? That, yeah, that's a great, that's a great question. And, and I have a couple of answers. One is you can't compare two years um, in this, in this climate. But what I will tell you is the local data we have on our students who have been in attendance is really solid. The students we are most worried about are the students who were not engaged or what we call partially engaged. Um, so as an example, we're here on a webinar and you can see that some of the people have blacked out their screens. Um, we worry that there are some students who check into class and make sure they're present but then don't really execute what they're supposed to do. Um, I've even talked to a few parents who, who see that in their own kids and have to prod them to get back on. Um, 
And that's one of the equity issues we talk about. Uh, if a student, if a student is at home with a family that that you know maybe everybody's working and they can't support the student at home um, or they don't have time to, those students are, are a little bit more challenged to stay engaged. So one additional follow-up question for that. So do we have, um, I imagine, you know, you'll work out the logistics as the school year starts and, you know, proceeds, but do you have um, some ideas in place so that teachers, of course, uh, already have a challenging time with all the children in the classroom, but we're going to be getting children back into the classroom who may really have uh, poor attention. Are there going to be outlets for these teachers as far as being able to send the child to somebody who can give them that extra attention so that the school classroom the other kids aren't um, going to then be kind of you know pushed to the back burner because we may be having some behaviors that are requiring more intense um, education. Yeah, I will, I will answer that in two ways. The, the first way is there was a slide I presented about the importance of building community uh, as one of the most, you know, of the foremost things under that social emotional learning. And the reality is that if you include a child in a community where they feel welcomed, seen, appreciated, heard, and engaged, the behaviors are minimal, period. And then the other thing we know, while while we do have multi-tiered system of supports in all our schools to support students that have, I would say probably they would be struggling with what life is giving them. Um, and so they enter the school on a daily basis carrying a weight that may not allow them to access their learning. Now, what we know is excluding those students doesn't improve their behavior. So what we try to do is help them gain the skill to work within what life is giving them. Um, and yeah, so that's part of our multi-tiered system of support. You saw the slide about working on restorative practices and trauma-informed instruction. That's exactly what we're doing. So I really appreciate that you recognize the fact that we have students who are worthy of that kind of nurturing care, support, and skill learning. Hey, um Brittany and then Charlene, I believe, and then Stephanie. I was talking today with Lauren, just kind of questioning on the program for this summer, it's a five week tutoring session or, or however long it happens to be. I know that the staff has been extremely overwhelmed in general. I can only imagine. Hmm. Um, do we think that we have enough staff to be able to have those tutoring sessions in the schools through the summer with our current teachers? Are we having to bring people on board? Um, the burn, I can imagine, I, thank God for every teacher and every staff member that are in our schools. Um, but then to ask them to then tutor in the summer is it, not to say that some of them would jump on board, but it, it's a lot to ask of them. So do we have enough staff to carry us through? So I've had that conversation with Lauren Pep. And what she said to me about this was, she was pleasantly surprised at the number of teachers who stepped up to say, yes, I want to be part of the summer tutoring. And there's no judgment at all. Right, You're yeah. absolutely right. If, if, we had, if we had some teachers who, who said, I, I just can't do it, that would be fine and dandy. I will say that part. And I will also say that I had a, I had a conversation with another principal today that what they're doing is our first number one priority is a student tutors with the teacher they just had or the teacher they're going to have so that we have a good relationship. Because mm -hmm. without the relationship, without that community, without that inclusion, you have nothing. Right. And so what we, what we have is we want those to be our priorities. But then the secondary level is if we have students whose teachers just can't do it, we're pairing them up with other teachers who can. Okay, um, that's, whether that's or not great. we have it all dialed in yet, that's still yet to be known, but I know we're working on it. Yeah, that's that's great because I think you know they all everybody deserves a break, in, including the administration. So I just want to make sure that across the board that that the teachers can you know get the break in the summer that they get. And I think that was part of the reason why they limited 
the time frame there instead of saying it would be six or seven weeks, like four or five weeks is enough. Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, Charlene. Yes, so, so Rob, this I think that you is important. I, I really am interested in this whole what, what's going to unfold, and I'm it's maybe more of a comment than maybe a question, but I'm hoping, and I'm sure you you've been working on this really hard, and I I feel like. I'm hoping we can really grab some good metrics on where our students will be and, and maybe I'm looking forward to hearing that that news in, in future meetings as far as the improvements that we can that we can get and how and how this is working for the students. You know, I, we, it would be some some good news that we could look forward to hearing. I'm hoping that you can really keep some good metrics on some of the things that you can measure to, to show the progress that we're that this will make because this is a big deal. Thank you for saying that. I hope to be reporting that. And that's one of the reasons we benchmark the kids a few times a year. It's also, if we're tutoring, our tutors have to keep data on what are the specific skill targets they're trying to hit and the progress they're making. Thank you. Okay, Stephanie. Stephanie, there you are. Oh, now you're back off. I was clicking the wrong button. Um, I just have a few questions. Are teachers going to be getting any sort of like training um, any, or like any classes that they can take to kind of work on helping the students who have been home for a year to kind of integrate back into and in, in regards to the trauma base? Um, is there going to be anything further for the teachers in regards to that? Yeah. So I was just talking to one of our principals today, Suzanne Engels, who was interested in organizing us. Um, getting a coach in to talk about, oh goodness, there was a special name of the type of classroom, but it was, it was a restorative kind of trauma-informed classroom. Um, zones of regulation as, as, a big, as a big topic within how you set your classroom up to be successful. And then along with, you know, from, from top to bottom, as an example, Rutland Middle School is making a real emphasis on project-based learning and engaged learning and paying, paying specific attention to that. So up and down the span, that's the truth. The other thing, you saw a slide on us developing a three-year professional development plan. I've said this at other meetings. You know, we walk into the woods for 15, 16 months. It, it's going to take at least that long to walk out. So as we start to get more and more and more focused on our PD time and investments, we'll get better and better at what we do. Okay, and another uh, one. Sorry, another kind of question. So did you use in the slide, you talked about flex. Is flex going back to more than just, was it three days a week this year? Mm. So I, I didn't mention flex, but I did mention credit recovery. Okay. Um, and so credit recovery is something that you can get at the high school on a daily basis. And we were able to add some credit recovery work after school for kids that had busy schedules. And as well as they're doing it during yes plan now. So I would, I would, um, I would have to check in with the high school team on exactly what the schedule would look like in the fall. All right, thank you. Yep. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Bliss. I'll remember to unmute. Um, and before we begin with the hiring, the summer hiring protocol, I just want to give a quick update. Uh, Glenn Scott had to leave the meeting for a family emergency, so we he will not he will give a written uh, report and we will get that to everybody um, with when he gets it to us. So, Mr. Olson, you're up again. Thanks, Shirley. And I, I apologize on behalf of Glenn. Um, just, just to be uh, really brief, this is the time where we, we are still in the middle of, of hiring for some open positions. And even with, as, as Rob was just saying, with our recovery money, and the possibility of hiring a few more folks, we, we're still really right, right in the middle of that process. So every summer we ask that uh, the board consider as, as we go through the interview process and eventually um, new hires come, come into the Longfellow and the superintendent's office, we will send out uh, an email description of, of who, we're, who we're offering positions to. Um, if you have any concerns about those positions, please let us know about those people. And uh, 
what happens at the end of the summer when, when our first board meeting takes place, we have all those folks on uh, the personnel memorandum for you to approve. So it's just the process that we use um, at this time of year. Anybody have any questions? Um, before we do hear a motion on that, I'd like to hear a motion to suspend the rules because I didn't put it on as an action item. That is my error. Um, so we can just make the motion to give Im implement the summer, summer hiring criteria like we have in the past. So moved. Is there a second? I'll second. Okay. Um, all those in favor of suspending the rules? So we can take this up. Okay, looks kind of unanimous, thank you. Uh, now I'd like to entertain a motion um, to implement our hiring summer protocol um, as we have in the past summers. So moved. Brittany, is there a second? And thank you. Uh, questions on the summer hiring protocol, and I think I saw Charlene, and I don't know if Ann has a question, but Charlene? I think she's frozen like that. Do I have a question? Yeah, do you have a question? Am I, I frozen? Think... Okay, you're frozen, okay. Does can anybody you hear, have a... Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Do you have a question on the summer hiring protocol? Me? Yeah. No. Okay. Are you talking to No. <laughs> okay. Please go on. <laughs> Ann, did you have your hand up? With the okay. Any questions about the hiring summer protocol? All right. All those in favor, sticking by by saying aye or raise your hand. My hand's up. Okay. Those opposed? Uh, motion carried. Okay. So now we're looking at committee reports. Oh, Charlene, again, don't freeze before your report. Am I here? Yes, you are here. Can you see me? I can see. Can Yes, we can see you. Okay, it is I'll time for like, the I'll finance really and fast. planning committee really report. Fast. Should I talk? Yeah. Okay. You want to know what happened at the finance committee? Is that what you want to know? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so <laughs> we talked about developing a structure, like a framework um, that we can use to set uh, priorities and focus on our, our focus our energy and resources to make sure that we're working towards the a common goal for the school district. Um, this would help. You know, we're going to put in short term, mid term, long term goals. Um, I think Ted, in his wealth of experience and knowledge, is going to uh, bring to the table that plus you know looking into other successful systems that we could probably implement. And I think once we adopt those and we developed that, we can use them for review and, and we will revise them as we go um, on an ongoing process. That's the, the general gist of the whole thing. And we would use it as a tool um, as we reviewed it, you know, whether it be, it doesn't have to just be annual, it could be more often or not, but um, hopefully it'll have a range of goals and I hope I covered it, the whole thing. Ted? I think you, you hit it. Charlene, I have nothing to add. Thank you though. All right. Anybody That's it for the finance questions? committee. Okay, questions? Okay, policy and procedure review. Have you met since the last time, uh, Dina? No, haven't met. Oh, Mr. Olson? Oh, oh, wait, wait, sorry. I thought you went policy committee. I was... <laughs> no. <laughs> I have brain syndrome right now. Uh, we've met, uh, when was it? Last week. Yes, um, so we met um, and we kind of, we met a couple times. We reviewed the charge of the committee and we've also requested uh, the assistant of the um, administrative team to help us find um, a, a expert to um, support our efforts. Um, and, you know, when you do that, sometimes you have to wait for people to respond to you and, and work around their time a little bit. So that has been a bit challenging, um, but I think we found somebody that um, can help us uh, process uh, the charge of the committee. 
And uh, I will hand it over to Bill Olson for a second, just to go over some of the information about the person that is going to be involved in this. Thanks, Tina. We, we're, we're going to be working with um, Chris Leopold, who's uh, an attorney with uh, McNeil, Letty, Letty and Sheehan. Chris has worked uh, with school boards all across the state for years. Um, and so we've asked him, you know, what, what kind of process would, would work for you as far as taking a look at the charge of uh, the, the, the committee has. I spoke with him today, actually. Um, and so he's asked me to send up the materials that we that the committee had. He's going to take an initial look at it and, and then get back to us. The challenge for him might be, I think the committee was talking about meeting next Tuesday, the 15th. Um, he might be able to do that. It depends it, it depends on how the rest of his work schedule goes. Um, so I don't know if we, we would have any feedback from him by that time for certain, but it's, it's still possible. He's, he, he said, I, I really need to look at what, what you have for us before I can give you, give you an indication. So uh, I hope that he, by the end of the month, by the end of the week, we'll have uh, some kind of clarity about how, what he has to do with that and whether we could have that meeting on the 15th or not. But he, he thinks for sure he would be done, you know, giving us any feedback that he, that he has by, um, I think he said, like the 25th or so of, of June. So it should be, should be able to be done by in the next couple of weeks. Any questions? Okay, Mr. Keith Faber, you are up for that big policy change. Kathy, Kathy had her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry. Kathy, I didn't see you down in the corner. <laughs> um, okay. Um, my question, I, I checked out Chris Leopold's uh, website and his credentials. And I see that he's not a parliamentarian, nor does he, he lists a lot of his credentials and Robert's rules is not among them at all. So I'm wondering why he is our expert. Kathy, I, I spoke with folks at uh, the Vermont School Boards Association and I said, can you, can you help us with, you know, they, they know our, they know our charge and, um, what we're, what we're looking to do. And I said, could you help us find someone that would be best for this? And his, his firm and, and he himself was one of the people that, that we had, that they had recommended, um, talked about, they talked about two different people actually. So uh, I had seen him working with the Vermont Superintendents Association and, and knew of his work. So I, that's, that's where I suggested to the committee that we go with him. Okay. And is he charging us to look over the materials? Yes. And did he give us an estimate of how many hours it would take him to review the materials? Well, he, he, when I spoke to him today, again, he hasn't seen any of the materials that we have. Um, so he said, I, I, I'd have to take a look to, to see what you're offering me. Um, he said, um, I don't think it would be any more than 10 hours. I think it could be as, ha as much as five hours. You know, could be something, something very short. Um, and, and then he also said, it depends on what you want me to perform for you. Um, if you would like to have an extensive written report, that's, that's, that's more time. If you would like me to talk to the committee, it could be less. Um, and, you know, it's just offer feedback verbally. So it's going to be a, between $1,000 and $2,000 at the minimum. That, yeah, I'd say around there. Yeah. Okay. All right, now we're to policy again, and Kevin, with your internet policy. Um, so uh, policy committee met, and we primarily focused on uh, the two policies. Um, there's a something in your packet, uh, policy committee work, uh, the two policies. One is on RHS graduation requirements. That would be policy number 7340. Um, and is Greg Schillinger available to speak up on this one? I am. Do you want me to weigh in on that one now, Kevin? Uh, yeah, if you could just give an overview and explain right. why the policy was put forth. I mean, it's it's basically to, to make graduation requirements a little more flexible, but you can do it better than that. <laughs> exactly. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, so uh, this is the existing graduation policy um, the, the proposed changes to the policy, what is not proposed 
it's the same uh, number of credits, it's the same number of credits distributed between the various disciplines. Um, what we have found over the years, there are a few areas, um, uh, not in all of the, the requirements, but there are a few areas where very specific courses are actually identified as the graduation requirement. So for example, in English, it says you need to take four credits in English, and that would be the same. Um, but in mathematics, for example, it says you need to take three credits, and one of them needs to be mathematics one. So <clears throat> we've come across over the years a number of occasions where that kind of specificity makes creativity more difficult. Um, in particular, what has really kind of accentuated that need is in this realm of COVID and recovery, we're really trying to encourage teachers to think about uh, flexible pathways to graduation. It's difficult to be flexible when every course of study has to pass through this one particular course uh, or uh, a couple of particular courses. So there's some spe uh, specificity left in the graduation policy in regards to some of the departments, but the, the watchword for these changes is basically an increase in flexibility while still maintaining the same standards that we've had in regards to graduation. Are there any questions? I have a question. Mm -hmm. Charlene, go so ahead. I'm just, I just wanna try and understand a little bit better. Are you saying, and I'm, I'm gonna like generalize maybe to that they may not have to take a math class to graduate? No, no, you definitely have to take a math class. You have to take the same number of credits in math. But what exists oh. before was there's a one semester course called Math One. So it was, you can take Math Two, Three, Four, Finance, AP Calculus, but you have to take Math One. And basically it made every course of study, it had to pass through that one specific course. Um, so same number of courses, same total number of credits to graduate, same number of courses within each discipline. It's just that in certain cases it identified, you know, in the social studies department, it included, for example, World History II. So we're still going to offer World History II. We're still going to offer those, those courses, but we're, I'm looking to remove some of the real specific course identifiers that are in there. So you're still going to take a history course, but if, if we wanted to offer uh, instead of specifically like uh, World History II, if we wanted to offer a social studies course in local history and have that count towards graduation requirement, that allows us the flexibility to do that without saying, all right, we have to call it World History II. Got it. Uh, Brittany, you have a question? Yeah. So is this something at the at the state level? I mean, even back when I was in high school, it was you took, you know, everybody took their first year of math or their first year of history or whatever mm -hmm. it happens to be. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little hesitant to to agree that kids then we can kind of decide. I think that is, is it something that we've looked down on a broader scale for the state of Vermont that everybody is doing it? Um, or is this something that we've decided it should be the new graduation requirement? So the, the graduation requirements are, are the, the, the framework is still the same. So the, below this policy are the procedures that are outlined in, for example, the program of studies. So the program of studies is within the purview of within the, within the school. This, this policy requires board action to change. So, so we're still gonna offer, for example, Mathematics One. And to your point, when freshmen enter, there's going to be sort of a general freshman math class. One of the challenges we have is, what if we have an eighth grader who maybe really didn't engage adequately in eighth grade math? Are we putting them automatically into Math One? Because we're, they're required to take it before they graduate. So at the procedural level, like the program of studies, all of those things still exist. You know, next year we're gonna offer math one, it will be enrolled, students will be enrolled in it. 
what we're looking for is, especially right now in, uh, in, these, in this sort of recovery from COVID phase, we really need to provide some flexibility to students in the, the specific math or, or, and I'm picking on math because it's at the top of the list, but whatever the, the set of courses that they're gonna take, they're still gonna take those things, but we're looking for flexibility in what the names of those courses are and what the, what the material is. Okay. I just don't want to, I just want to make sure that if we're, you know, like everybody across the board takes world history, everybody takes civics mm -hmm. or whatever it happens to be that we are continuing with those things and just not kind of bringing in other classes to fill the classes, if that makes sense. Correct. I agree. All right. Um, Stephanie. And again, this is only the first reading. So if Miss. Okay, Stephanie. It's, so it's the first reading and, um, you know, there, my guess is it's gonna be a few more. So I'm guessing this will not take effect for the next school year, two readings. I, I'm i gonna revert to probably Mr. Bliss, but I'm assuming yep. it will take effect as long as, as the minute we approve it. So today is first reading and yep. you have to have two readings. So at the next regular meeting, of the board, if this policy passes second reading, it will then be in effect. And I think uh, Greg can correct me if I'm wrong, but when you enter into um, the graduation requirements, this wouldn't have any kind of negative impact on any existing students, is that correct? That, that's correct. Not, nothing would change students for the class of 2021 would be abiding by the policy that has existed previously. Um, you know, for, for another example of one of the proposed changes is uh, including language that says, you know, completion of year-end studies is a graduation requirement. That's in the policy. Well, we haven't offered year-end studies for this year and last year. So what we've done for the last two years is gone to the board to ask for that, that uh, exception. Those same freshmen, this year's freshmen, that will need to apply to them for the four years in the future. You know, so part of what's included there is language that says uh, it's a graduation requirement. And next year when we offer yes plan, it would be a, a graduation requirement, but it, with the exception of those years when the yes plan was not offered by the school. So follow up to my, the rest of my, my question. So with that being said, if the policy does go into effect before the start of the school year, do the students who are in those classes that are no longer required for graduation, will they get the option to go into a different class? Because if you have to take a class because it's required, but it's not really necessarily when you want, do you have to now stay in it? And that could be something you guys are still working on as for that answer. Can you um, look at do you have the copy of the policy in front of you? The, the wording is, is not dramatically different. Um, like Greg was saying, in the mathematics, you're still required to take three credits. It's just that you have more flexibility in what those three credits are. You don't have to take mathematics one, but you still need to take three credits. Right, I understand that. Okay, and, and similarly in science, there used to be three categories that you had to take your three credits in. Now there are two more, ge more general credit categories you need to take credits in both life science and physical science instead of specifying biology, chemistry, and earth science. So um, there are still requirements. Allison. They're just a little more, more uh, flexible. Right. Allison? I just have a couple of questions. Um, so one, I presume that they're still in line with the state standards for proficiency-based grading and meeting all the state graduation requirements. Um, and my other question, is this supported by the curriculum coordinators, the teachers, the subject matter experts and such as, as their daily practice? Yes. Okay. All right, all right, Kevin, now, do you want to take them up individually as accepting the first reading, or do you want to put them together? Because we have a first reading also on our computer technology. Why don't we do them separately since we have Greg here? Yeah. All right, so let's do this one. Um, is there a motion to accept the first reading of the RHS graduation requirement 7340? 
Can so I make the motion? Yeah. I'm move okay. the move the second. 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 Okay. Any questions on accepting for the first reading? Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Didn't see any. Okay, so now let's look at our other one. Thank you, Mr. Schillinger. Let's Thank look at the much. one that was a total rewrite. Patricia's here for that. Is Patricia here? Yeah, I am. Here. How are you? Great. How are you? Good. Thanks for having me this evening. So my recollection of this policy was that there are lots of funding sources that um, rely on the guidelines of a certain federal group um, whose name I cannot remember. Um, and we changed our policy to match their requirements so that we were open to more funding. Is that I think, correct me um, if I'm wrong? I think you're on the right track. Um, okay. So when we, when we look at um, our policy, um, one of, one of the things uh, as I was reviewing um, uh, the rules around uh, USAC and receipt of funds um, and some guidelines from the Agency of Education, it took me back to this model policy. And so this model policy uh, came out um, in 2019 and I pulled it up and uh, I thought, wow, it's a lot more comprehensive. Um, and I think it's a better representation of what um, uh, USAC would like to see in a policy. So, you know, when I look at Question. the difference, pardon me. I'll go ahead, Patricia. Uh, the Universal um, uh, Service Administration, which is one of the places where uh, we get funding through the E-rate program. So Questions this of Kevin, the policy. Oh, sorry, Patricia, you've been cutting in and out. Maybe it's just my my machine. I I think I'm just a little pokey tonight, maybe. Um, but uh, I just wanted to say that um, uh, you know uh, this is um, a lot of this information uh, you would find in um, in the information that parents and kids sign. So this actually just brings it back into the policy instead of the procedure. Questions? Okay. Do I have a motion to accept the first reading of policy number 6131, Responsible Computer Network and Internet Use? So moved. Oh, I'll second. That, okay. Any discussion? All those in favor, signify by saying aye or raise your hands. Aye. 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 Those opposed? All right, we accept that first reading. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you, thanks for having me. Have a nice night. Okay. As, as we're getting into um, the end of old and new business, I wanna talk first about the summer board meeting schedule and retreat planning. On June 22nd, we, I, we will be having a special board meeting. It's gonna be more of a public forum um, on the name and the mascot. And there's probably a high probability that it will be in person. Mr. Olson and I have been checking our emails constantly to see when we're gonna be in person. Any uh, committees meeting during the summer, please be aware uh, that um, as soon as the emergency order drops, we have to confirm to in-person, which is open meeting law and all of that stuff. Um, so we will do that. And we will be looking at ways that we can uh, include Zoom and um, regular in-person for the June 22nd meeting. I think that was a question that was given to Mr. Olson today. And then on the 24th will be our first regular because August 10th, we'll do a retreat. Um, I will be calling a couple people who would- Early, could you back up? You broke up a few couple times and I missed the dates. I, it, my, my internet today. Um, so on the 22nd, it's gonna open a forum 
Uh, Mr. Olson and I are going to be with things for people are remote and how we handle that through the school board association. That is basically what, what we have to worry about the minute the executive order is lifted. And for those people who are having summer meetings, please just make sure you check to see uh, the order has lifted, I'm sure you'll, which just means to go back to meeting committee wise in person um, at the super's office. So um, the retreat is going to be August 10th. I'm going to be a couple of people to give a hand for the retreat. One of the things we're talking about doing is that training um, and, or maybe possibly part of the retreat being that training. Um, Aaron and I will be working on details uh, as it comes closer. And August 24th, the uh, regular meeting of the year. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over to Ted right now uh, for a resolution uh, for Vermont School Board Association's member. Yes, Ann, I'm sorry. I have a question about the meetings. Did you say the 24th, August 24th? The, that August 24th should be a Tuesday. What is it? You kept cutting out. It's August 24th, a Tuesday. What's that's our August first 24th? Oh, I'm sorry. That's our first regular meeting of the new school board. Of the school board? School year. Okay. And then um, are okay. we able to, we're going to be starting up recording um, full board meetings. Did we have our, um, we didn't have our committee meetings recorded, did we? Post, pre pandemic i don't think we did right not pre-pandemic no. we did it's only we had minutes there was always a minute taker in each Thank of the committees okay okay ted i'm going to turn it over to you okay thank you hurley thank you everyone uh in your board packets you should have a one pager that's entitled resolution for submission to the full VSBA membership. I'm also going to attempt to share my screen here to pull up a couple of charts that summarize what's going on with the waiting study and uh, what that resolution is about. Can everybody see my screen all right? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. So I wanna give you just a very brief update on the legislative status, uh, which we had an important event this week, and then just talk about that proposed resolution that's been drafted by the Burlington School Board. Um, so let's see, let's go to the legislative update. So on Monday afternoon, Governor Scott signed Senate Bill number 13 which establishes a task force to implement the recommendations of the 2019 UVM pupil weighting factor study. Uh, that is a very important milestone because um, if, though, if that study and its recommendations are implemented, that could have significant ramifications for the ability of districts such as Rutland City Public Schools to provide educational programs and funding um, needed by our constituents. The bill was passed by four committees, two in the House, two in the Senate. It went through very extensive um, testimony and review um, and, and emerged, uh, and emerged uh, with very high votes of approval in all the committees. So the task force that's going to be set up and which will be working for the next six months will include two members from each committee uh, that was involved. So there'll be eight members in total. And the, uh, this will be exclusively a legislative task force because there won't be members of the AOE or other, uh, or other agencies technically on the committee. And their charge will be to figure out what steps specifically are gonna be needed and what the time frame would be to implement the weighting factor study recommendations. That report is to be presented uh, this coming January. So what I wanted to advise the board about is that the Burlington School District has recently passed a resolution to support implementing the recommendations of the study. Burlington is currently seeking co-sponsors 
to join in asking the Vermont School Boards Association to adopt this resolution. This is purely an elective matter, a discretionary one on your part. If you, if you think that it would add value and would be something you're comfortable with, one of the reasons why Burlington has drafted this resolution and is seeking co-sponsors to add a little weight to the, uh, to the request is because any resolution that's adopted by, by the Vermont School Board Association becomes its official position on all educational issues. And then of course, as many of you know, VSBA works very closely with the legislature on all educational matters. Why, why should we care about that? Well, because over the next six months, this eight member task force is gonna be developing the specific plans of how to implement the UVM recommendations, when they should take effect, where emphasis and resources should be placed. And whatever plan they come up with could have very significant implications for district budgets and programs. There's not necessarily a set answer for how that comes out. Therefore, the Burlington School Board and Twin Valley School Board, which has also recently voted to co-sponsor it, would like the SBA to weigh in and uh, offer, offer their support for recommending the, um, the task force report as written. So what I'm gonna do on the next few charts, just to give you a little bit of orientation and so you can assess, is this something that your board would like to endorse and co-sponsor or perhaps not? Uh, the resolution contains nine basic provisions and I've got three of them recapped on each of the next three slides. My intent is not to go into them in detail but simply to pose the question, and you can read faster than I could speak, how is the resolution worded? And would you consider its statements problematic or perhaps controversial or straightforward? So all I'm gonna say about the first three articles of the resolution are that these words are quoted directly from the UVM study. Well, should that matter? Uh, all I can say to you along those lines is even when members of these various legislative committees disagreed with how to go about implementing the task for implementing the study recommendations, there was almost a unanimous support for the quality and the integrity of how the study was conducted. So, you know, uh, everybody is going to have their different perspective. Some of these words you know, could raise some questions, but I want you to know that these provisions are directly out of the UVM study, which of course was led by Professor Tammy Colby out of UVM, who's very highly regarded. The next three provisions are pretty straightforward as well. Two of them are just facts. Uh, when the legislature commissioned the study, when the report was issued. The sixth section um, is an opinion. It says that the report was clear in its recommendations. In other words, the resolution is setting up to say the recommendations are clear, so go implement them as written. That's certainly an opinion. Some people would consider something clear, something might, some people might not, but it is an opinion that's shared by many. Um, the last three uh, provisions of this resolution are pretty interesting. Uh, the seventh one talks about the VSBA and member districts being committed to advocating uh, and working to achieve equitable access. Well, we had some discussion earlier this evening about what does equity mean? What does equality mean? Um, just so you'll know, the VSBA defines equity as I've written here. Equity in the VSBA sense goes beyond formal equality, and it involves achieving equity such that unequal distribution of resources and services may be required to meet students where they are. Um, another statement that is in the Burlington resolution says that the VSBA is being asked to fully support the findings as presented in the report. All I can tell you about that is that when I see the word fully, that means everything. The report is 150 pages. I've read much of it, but not all of it. And it's a pretty tough read and so, so that's a pretty broad statement. And people might be uh, a little bit concerned about being so absolute. Um, the VSBA does want the Vermont legislature, obviously, to thoughtfully and most importantly, expeditiously implement this plan. Um, the last point that I would make is why should, why should this district consider um, signing on as a co-sponsor? 
I pulled some data from uh, the public school review.com just to see which are the biggest high schools by enrollment in 2021, according to their data. And I apologize that the numbers and the names are, are close together and not spaced out, but you can see that, um, that the, the Burlington school district is, is number three and Rutland Senior High School is number seven. So, I mean, we're in the top 10 uh, public high schools by, by virtue of enrollment. So when you have a couple of those larger schools and districts involved, that obviously can, can be a, an important factor. So I'm gonna stop sharing. The last thing that I'd wanna say is if you're thinking about cost and benefit, should I put my, should I put my name behind a, a resolution like this? I would tell you that it might be, it might be beneficial in terms of helping the VSBA uh, take up the matter of this resolution and then uh, work with the legislature. I would like to think that whether or not Rutland City Public Schools signs on uh, probably would not be the make or break deal for this resolution. But again, uh, just as part of our job, I wanted to uh, put this opportunity out in front of you. Uh, and then with that, I'll, I'll stop talking. And of course we have members of, of the board who are also participating in the coalition familiar with this, who, who may want to pick up and, and mention perspectives that, uh, that, that I have missed. So with that, I'll, I'll... We did We did put this on as an action item. Mm -hmm. And I guess I'm going, I'm looking at you for your pleasure. If this is something you feel we should sign on to or not, if someone would like to make a motion and then we can have a discussion. Allison? I would like to make a motion um, that Rutland City Public School Board sign on as a co-sponsor to the resolution um, as presented um, to submit it to VSBA. Okay, thank you. Is there a second? Second. second. Okay, lots of seconds on that. So discussion um, before a vote. Is there any discussion on this matter or additional information that might be needed from Allison and her committee and Ted? Uh, Trisha. Yes, if I recall, there had been um, some discussion that this was going to be a uh, cost incurred by the district to get on this, correct? Allison, would you like to speak to that or would you like me to? Uh, you can go ahead, Ted. Okay, thank you. So yes, Trisha, um, the board approved earlier this year a contribution of $3,000 to the Coalition for Vermont Student Equity. We did double check with the uh, legal counsel to make sure that that would be consistent with uh, our fiduciary responsibilities. And uh, the district did pledge $3,000. Um, uh, other districts like Burlington have pledged $5,000. I think the total that's been raised uh, so far among 21 or 22 members of the coalition is is a bit over 15,000. And that was basically raised for the purpose of engaging uh, a lobbyist uh, who's very familiar with the goings on in the legislature and and frankly, you know, from my perspective was invaluable in terms of understanding uh, who to approach, when, what to say uh, in order for people in, in the government to understand how important this was to, to many school districts across the state. Ted, there's no cost to the resolution. Is that correct? There's no cost. Oh, there's no cost to the resolution. Absolutely right. I, I thought you were talking about the districts. I apologize that I didn't understand your question clearly. Uh, I thought okay. you were speaking to the question of financial support in general, but that is absolutely right. If you elect to pass this resolution, there's absolutely no impact on district expenditures. Uh, Tricia, then Allison. Okay. So one final follow-up with that is, so is this something that is a one-time, you know, contribution that we're giving, or will you have to periodically this, be giving money to this to keep this person, you know, coming okay. to continue? But the thing is that that's different than the resolution that's on yeah. the floor, so I have to just, I have to make sure that the discussion is, is on the resolution only because it's been made and seconded. Uh, that, that was, I believe in the minutes, a one-time contribution, but that was done beforehand. The, what we can debate right now is the motion on, on the floor to sign or to engage in the resolution and be a co-sponsor with Burlington 
and other schools at no cost um, to Rutland City Public Schools. Any, okay, Allison? So I was just gonna add, um, so yeah, outside of the cost, I mean, you can have cost benefit analysis. Ted's done that before and, and we can update that at a later time. Um, but the benefit to signing on to this is if VSBA takes up the resolution, then they will also be using our dues and forwarding the cause that would significantly impact um, our, avail our available funds to educate our students and um, help out with our tax rate. Okay, thank you. Um, any other discussion? Okay, uh, Charlene, and then we'll take the vote. So I'm not sure if this is a valid question. Are there proponents that are on the other side of the coin here that are going to be lobbying against this? And who, I, how big of a, or is that not a good question at the moment? Um, I would assume that there are people who are against uh, the weighted study and I'll let Allison respond. What, what's the magnitude of that? Do we know, or that's, I guess my question. I believe close to 70% of districts would um, benefit from the weights being implemented. Uh, but the ones that would not would be uh, what was before Act 60 or Gold Towns, um, the towns that have a lot more money, tax revenue, and resources. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, so uh, the motion on the floor is to sign the resolution and be a co-sponsor with Burlington and I believe 20 or 21 other districts. Um, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye or raise your hand. Sorry. Aye. And it looks unanimous, okay. Um, thank you, and that motion passes. Um, Bill, did you want to talk quickly about the emergency order before I ask if there's uh, any other new or old business before we go into executive session? I think you mentioned it before, we're expecting uh, that the school board, when the emergency order is list, lifted, the school board's association is, is saying that board should be meet again in person. So okay. um, really, right. as simple as that, really. Thank you. Uh, we do have a need to go into executive session. Um, is there any other new world business that you, seeing none, uh, Aaron, would you like to make the motion? Sure, I move that we go into executive sessions for the purposes of negotiation um, updates and personnel matters that premature disclosure would put the board at a disadvantage in the opinion of the chair. Okay. Okay. Second. Second. okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Right. Right. 